Today I'm going to talk about scenarios, so essentially um, where did greenhouse gas emissions come from uh, in the past and where may they go to uh, in the future. <clears throat> I showed this uh, one yesterday. Uh, this is all the changes that we've made to the energy balance of the planet uh, since pre-industrial times. Um, and if the past is so complex, then of course you can expect you expect the future to have a similar sort of complexity. Right? So whenever uh, we're doing emissions scenarios or climate scenarios for the future, you need to have CO2 in there and methane and halocarbons and ozone, or the ozone precursors rather, uh, <coughs> aerosols, land use change, and so on and so forth. Right? We'll be mostly talking about CO2. Principles for scenario building are the same. Principles for emission reduction are roughly the same. Um, so I'll be focusing on CO2, but you should not forget that there's more to climate uh, than carbon dioxide. CO2 in itself is also fairly, uh, these are all uh, greenhouse gases. These are total emissions um, in the world in 2005. Um, in blue, you're looking at CO2. It's by far the biggest source of greenhouse gases. Uh, here is methane, about 20%. Uh, uh, laughing gas is about 80%. The HFC, VFC, SF6 is smaller than that, but the big bulk of the emissions come uh, from CO2. Uh, but CO2 in itself is also fairly, um, fairly diverse. The biggest source at the moment of CO2 emissions, uh, biggest source of CO2 emissions um, is the generation of particularly power, uh, but also heat, and uh, it's 32%. And um, after that, uh, there's uh, transport with 15%. A lot of CO2 is uh, used in manufacturing, it's 14% uh, in our homes, apart from the power and the heat. 8%, uh, this is industrial heat, by the way. Uh, this is mostly residential heat, uh, and then there's other sources as well. <coughs> it immediately suggests that there's a the wide range of processes and uh, sectors and activities that uh, emit uh, CO2. So as I said, the most important source, uh, the most important greenhouse gas is carbon dioxide, and the most important source of CO2 uh, is the combustion of fossil fuels. Um, <clears throat> this is intrinsic to the process. This is not some nuisance uh, or anything. In, in economic terms, it's an externality. Uh, but in chemical terms, uh, it is uh, absolutely not. Um, so what happens, um, we take a carbohydrate. It's a carbohydrate because it has carbon atoms and it has hydrogen uh, atoms in. Uh, and then we oxidize it, we burn it. So what you do chemically is you break the bonds between the C and the H, and that costs energy. And then the C forms a new bond with the oxygen that you put in to make CO2. And that delivers energy. The H also uh, forms a new chemical bond with the oxygen to form H2O, uh, water vapor. And that also uh, brings energy. So we invest a little bit of energy break the bond between the C and the H, and then we get a lot of energy in return from the formation of new bonds with the oxygen that we have to provide as well, otherwise it won't burn. Um, and that is where the energy comes from. So you cannot sort of treat this as the way we treat, say, sulfur uh, in coal, but which causes uh, acid rain. That is an e economic externality. But it's also a chemical nuisance. There's absolutely no reason why you would want to burn coal to get sulfur uh, dioxide out. It's just it's a chemical nuisance uh, as well as an economic nuisance. And not so for CO2. The only way to get the energy out of the fossil fuel is by making CO2. That's where the energy comes from. And that's an important thing uh, to keep in mind. Uh, <coughs> Fossil fuels are not created uh, equally, they're probably not created, um, but formed by uh, geological processes. 
Um, <coughs> peat uh, is essentially a very young form uh, of fossil fuels. Uh, it's the heaviest uh, in terms of uh, CO2 emissions. In this country, we don't burn peat. In the neighboring country, Ireland, there's still a lot of peat burning uh, for uh, power generation. Well, it's for home heating in other countries uh, in the world. There's lots of um, peat burning still uh, as well. Uh, coal um, is next. Um, the units here is the amount of CO2 that comes out per energy gain, the terajoules. Uh, petrol is about 70, gas uh, is about uh, 57. So we immediately, it's not just that different fuels are created differently in terms of their CO2 emissions per energy gain. We also immediately have here an option to reduce greenhouse gases, right? Uh, and this has been done in the United States. Uh, what you're looking at uh, at the top line, so the year is 2001 to 2012. Uh, this is total uh, CO2 emissions from the power generation sector, uh, and what you see is that emissions have fallen, and that is the black line uh, that you're looking at here. Uh, it was 4,500, uh, 4, in the year 2001 it's down to almost 4,000 in the year 2012, it has uh, fallen further since. Um, and the reason that this happened is very simple, they used to have a lot of coal, and what they've been doing is substituting the coal, uh, substituting coal by <coughs> gas. And this all comes out of the shale gas revolution, right? Shale is um, very, very cheap. Um, and they've essentially been closing down coal-fired power plants and building uh, and, and working the, the existing uh, gas-fired power plants harder. Um, <clears throat> And as a result, the emissions uh, have fallen, they've uh, fallen uh, further still. And um, the gain there is, is pretty simple, right? So coal, this is average coal, there's lots of varieties of coal. But, uh, the average is about 95 tons of CO2 per terajoule uh, of electricity versus gas, it's is lower than 60. So <coughs> that's roughly, uh, well, it's more than a third uh, that you take off if you make this uh, switch. <clears throat> so there you immediately have an option for reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Other sources uh, of carbon dioxide emissions are land use chains, uh, a particularly important source uh, in some countries, 20-25% uh, uh, globally. And essentially what we've been doing is replace big trees with small grass, so organic matter, carbohydrates again. Um, so if you chop down something that is big and full of carbohydrates and you replace it with something that is small and full of carbohydrates, the CO2 has to go somewhere. Uh, and typically the way uh, we remove forests is by setting fire to them. Uh, and then they just burn up and CO2 uh, is vented into the atmosphere. The energy is uh, and not used. Um, <clears throat> The third source, about 2% of uh, CO2 uh, emissions, is cement production. Essentially what you do there is you take the limestone and then you put it uh, in a kiln and you drive out the carbon uh, from uh, the limestone. And if you do that, then limestone uh, turns into cement. So cement is essentially limestone with the carbon taken out and then typically that carbon is bent into the atmosphere. So this is a chemical process rather than a physical process uh, that would get you uh, from fossil fuels to CO2. Uh, and again you can't make cement without taking out the carbon and putting it somewhere. Right? Similarly you can't, for land use things, you can't have grass that stores as much carbohydrates as trees do, right? That's simply uh, impossible. So all of this is intrinsic to uh, the economic activity. Second most important uh, greenhouse gas, anthropogenic greenhouse gas, uh, is methane, or CH4. Um, where does that come from? The important source uh, are ruminants, basically cows, uh, 
Uh, buffaloes, yaks, um, camels, sheep, essentially anything that sort of like walks around and eats grass, almost anything that walks around and eats grass. And again, this is intrinsic to the process. So what do cows do? They eat grass and they convert it to meat and to milk. All carbohydrates, but if you look at the chemical composition of grass, you would find that there's a lot of hydrogen in it. If you look at the chemical composition of meat or of milk, you would find much less hydrogen. So somehow, the cows need to get rid of the excess hydrogen in the process of converting in their stomachs um, the grass into something that is useful for them and eventually useful for us. Um, <coughs> and the way they do this is that a long, long time ago they formed a symbiotic relationship with methanogenetic uh, bacteria. And what happens in the stomach of a cow is that the grass that comes in, it's sort of like uh, ground up and it's mixed with all sorts of stuff, and then there is hydrogen uh, that needs to get rid of. And what these bacteria do is they sacrifice one useful carbon atom to take out four dangerous hydrogen atoms to make CH4. And this is chemically actually the most efficient way of getting rid of all that excess hydrogen. If, carbon, if cows don't get rid of the hydrogen, then two things can happen. If you have free-floating hydrogen in the atmosphere, you form hydrogen radicals, OH. They are extremely reactive and they corrode everything. In a cow's uh, stomach, there's not a lot of oxygen around, so that is actually uh, not the case. What the second route that hydrogen can take is to make H2, hydrogen gas. And then you don't have a cow, you have a zeppelin, right? It starts floating up in the air, which is not uh, wise. Uh, <coughs> uh, Communicate with other cows, right? Um, so this is the way they biologically solve it. And that again shows how deeply embedded the CH4 emissions are there. And I said most animals that eat grass, that wander around and eat grass, the exception to this is the kangaroo. They make acetone rather than, they, I always forget, uh, rather than uh, CH4. It also tells you how much you should change the metabolism of a cow in order to avoid these emissions, right? You essentially need to turn the metabolism of a cow into the metabolism of a kangaroo to avoid the methane emissions. And that's a long way to go on the evolutionary trick, right? Uh, or we could just all stop eating cow steak and start eating kangaroo steak. People tell me it's actually not very pleasant. Um, <coughs> so that is an important source of methane. And as people eat more and more meat, and of course in the UK we're gradually moving to a more and more vegetarian diet, but in places like China and India, uh, they're moving more, and in Africa, I'll be next, they're moving more and more to a meat-based diet. Um, uh, this is an important source of methane. Another uh, important source of methane is paddy rice, uh, or rice that is grown uh, on the water, uh, wet rice essentially, um, as well as uh, waste, uh, organic waste uh, in landfill. The process is the same. So what happens? with rice uh, is that you grow it in a field that is flooded and the leaves fall, the dead leaves fall into the water uh, essentially and then they have to degrade. But they're in an oxygen starved environment, they're on the water, not a lot of oxygen so they can't go to CO2 so they take uh, another route and they go to CH4. Essentially if organic material rots in an oxygen poor environment, it turns into methane. And it just uh, bubbles up into the atmosphere. Uh, you would see the same thing uh, in swamps around here. So-called swamp gas is the same process as paddy rice. Uh, if you're familiar with that. <coughs> and the same thing happens 
if you put food waste into your bin and your bin gets dumped into a landfill, uh, other waste is dumped on top, so there's not a lot of options to, to go around the food rot and it turns into methane, right? <clears throat> and uh, the final source of methane is leakage. Methane is a strange creature. It's, we often call it methane. It's CH4. Sometimes we call it natural gas. It's the exact same thing, chemically. It's just that if it's, methane, if it's a waste product, we call it methane. If it's useful, we call it natural gas. Um, but it's the exact same thing. If you transport gas in a pipeline that is not fully sealed, some of it uh, will get out. If you're mining coal, you will get, uh, you will also find uh, little bubbles of methane or natural gas that are trapped with the coal and that is released and so on and so forth. And uh, all that adds to uh, the concentration of methane in the atmosphere. And then there's nitrous oxide, the third most uh, anthropogenic greenhouse gas. That essentially comes uh, from agriculture. Um, suggest that there's nitrogen in here. The most important source there is excess fertilization of uh, agriculture, uh, essentially. Yeah, so farmers want their plants to grow, so they throw on lots of uh, fertilizers. The plants ignore the, the excess nitrogen that is provided and that is converted in the soil uh, to uh, H2O uh, and that is emitted um, into the atmosphere from there <coughs> and contributes to uh, the enhanced greenhouse effect. And then there's the HFCs, the CFCs, the SF6, the PFCs, whatever. Uh, <coughs> they are all sort of industrial gases. Most of them don't occur naturally and they all have specialized applications. Some are used to make foam, some are used to as a refrigerant, uh, some are used to make semiconductors to sort of like remove the uh, unwanted parts of the, of the semiconductor. Uh, <coughs> they are essentially used as solvents uh, and so on and so forth. And um, there's a long, long list of these gases. Most of them are completely artificial and uh, most of them are emitted in very small quantities and most of them are extremely potent greenhouse gases. They sort of have the same warming effect as 10,000 or 30,000 and in some cases 100,000 CO2 molecules. Um, so they're small quantities is <laughs> actually another reason not to be worried about them. Okay, so this is where the stuff comes from. And uh, this is another uh, look at the past and then we're going to look at scenarios, the actual topic. Um, what could happen in the future? There's two things on the ground. And in black, you're looking for the last 40 years or so, you're looking at worldwide CO2 emissions from uh, fossil fuel combustion. And what you see is that they've roughly doubled uh, in emissions per year between 1970 and the year 2010. Um, and I've just described to you where all these things come from, all the different sectors and so on and so forth um, and it, it is just hard to understand like emissions double that is obvious that uh, can be measured um, but where did it come from what are the most important factors that drive this and one way of thinking about this is the so-called Kaya identity um, named after uh, Yoichi uh, Kaya of the University of Tokyo uh, at that time um, and the Kaya identity is an identity. You can't argue with it, right? It's simply true. Uh, so what uh, Kaya uh, noted is that emissions E equal uh, the number of people B times their per capita income, Y over P, times the energy intensity of the economy, X over Y, times the emission intensity of energy use, uh, E over X. So what we have here is population size, GDP, total economic activity, X, total energy use, and E, total emissions. And you can't argue with this, right? Because P cancels against P, Y cancels against Y, X cancels against X, and what you have is that E is E, right? This is true. 
It's not an assumption. It's not a theory. It's an identity. This is simply true. I was a bit embarrassed by <laughs> triviality of this, so we actually never published it properly. Um, but uh, other people took it and ran with it. Um, <clears throat> even though it's trivial in a way, it's actually very helpful in understanding past emission trends uh, as well as uh, future emission trends and what you need to do to build a scenario of future emissions. Uh, so, what we found is that CO2 emissions have doubled uh, over 40 years, and then the question is why? And what we do here is that we decompose the change in uh, emissions into the four constituent components uh, of the chi identity. And uh, the first one is population, here given in blue. Uh, and what we find is that between 1970 and the year 2010, uh, the world population has grown by 80%, which immediately implies that emissions per capita have gone up, right? Emissions have doubled, number of people has grown by, emissions have grown by 100%, population has grown by 80%, so emissions per capita must have grown by roughly 20%. Income, by coincidence, GDP per capita has also grown by roughly 80% over that period. So also the, um, no, that doesn't follow. Um, <laughs> so uh, the total economy has grown by 80% plus 80%, and 80% times 80%, say roughly 170%. CO2 emissions have only grown by 100%. So the CO2 intensity of the economy, the amount of CO2 we uh, emit per dollar value added must have fallen, right, by roughly 70%, right? 80% times 80% is, let's make it, 160, let's just pretend that we can add up these things. So emissions must have fallen by 60%, uh, emission intensity must have fallen by 60%. Emission intensity comes in two components. First, according to the chi identity, is energy intensity, here given in a hungry sort of uh, orange. Emission intensi uh, energy intensity of the economy has fallen by about 30% between uh, 1970 and the year 2010. And then uh, the carbon intensity of the energy sector used to come down, but actually has reverted, and that's fallen by um, less than 10% over the 40-year period, right? But it's uh, the energy intensity uh, that is actually a much more important factor in uh, explaining the gap between the growth rate of emissions and the growth rate of the economy, right? Uh, so the Kai identity is useful in understanding what is actually driving uh, these emissions, right? Where do they actually come from? Um, <coughs> and once we begin to understand where emissions came from in the past, we begin, can begin to wonder where uh, will emissions go to in the future. I showed this graph uh, yesterday. The different colors on the graph uh, denotes different ways in which the future uh, may uh, unfold. And essentially what people did here who developed uh, those curves is that they took something a bit more complicated uh, than the Chi identity, but it's very similar in structure, um, and uh, projected uh, these things forward into the future. And the future for climate change is at least 100 years, right? Well, here it's 85 years, but we need to go uh, at least 84. And we need to go at least um, uh, to the end of this century, uh, but preferably a bit further, uh, to fully understand the scale of the problem. So what do we need to do? If you want to build a scenario of how the future uh, climate would be, is you need to predict how many people there will be on the planet in the year 2100. And you will need to predict how rich they will be, how much energy they will use, what sort of energy they will use. Methane is also a very important greenhouse gas, so you would also need to predict um, what they will eat, how much they will eat, 
how that food is grown, and so on and so forth, right? And you immediately see the big problem there, right? I mean, let's just start at the beginning again. For most countries on the planet, we don't know how many people there are now. Right? There are these websites that will give you to the exact number how many people there are on the planet. That's complete nonsense, right? We don't know that. Even in a country that is as well organized as Germany, because of confidentiality laws, we don't know how many people there are legally in the country. We won't be off by more than a few thousand, but still we don't know the exact number. If you go to a country like Nigeria, do you really believe that the country is capable of counting the number of people there? No, there's large parts of the country where the government doesn't go. Same is true for countries like uh, Pakistan, let alone Somalia, right? Well, isn't even a government. Um, let alone that there's somebody who's counting uh, birds and deaths and how many people there are, right? So we don't know how many people there are in the year 2016 let alone that we can predict with confidence how many people there will be in the year 2100, right? A population is the easy problem. You must have picked up in the three years that you've been here that predicting economic growth is also not the easiest problem uh, in the world, right? Um, so this is difficult. This is very, very difficult. People have done it, and these are the scenarios we typically work with again uh, split out uh, according to the chi identity, the colors are roughly the same as you saw in the previous graph. So we have population, we have uh, income, we have energy intensity, we have carbon intensity. Um, and sort of big lines are sort of the average of a whole range of models. So it is the error bars around it is the range of model results. What you see is that models tend to agree with one another, not necessarily because uh, they uh, because the problem is, is, is easy, but uh, there is a lot of group thing uh, around here. Um, just to illustrate some of the uncertainty that is around here, um, until one year ago, this was sort of the best guess of the World Bank, that is the major source of population projections, that is sort of said. We're going to reach a maximum uh, of about 9 billion by the year 2050, and then uh, total population is going to decline. That was until two years ago, and everybody took this as the baseline scenario. Then they had another close look at fertility rates in Africa and found that they had been declining rapidly for a short period but then they reverse back to the historical norm again, that they're declining very, very slowly, and the world bank changed its mind. Um, and they actually switched uh, to this scenario, which most people said had a low probability until two years ago, it's now uh, our best guess, where the number of people continues to grow until the end of the century, and there will be 14 billion people on the planet. And the difference between the eight that you have here and the 14 that you have there are five billion people in Africa, or rather five billion people from African descent, right? They're not necessarily will be in Africa uh, by the end of the century, <coughs> but they will be most likely born there. Um, so that is population. Um, here we're looking at projections of per capita income, um, and if we take the most pessimistic scenario, the future is bright. If you make make the most optimistic uh, scenario, the future is very bright. Um, the reason that there is no scenario of economic stagnation is because these scenarios are developed in a UN context, and basically what they've done is added up the economic plans of all the governments in the world. And governments always say, elect us, we're going to make the economy grow. And basically added up uh, those promises. This explains why these scenarios sort of exclude the notion that some countries just don't grow, or worse, right? Um, here we're looking at uh, energy um, intensity, so the amount of CO2 you need per uh, dollar or pound value added. In black, you're looking at past history, 
And in colors, we're looking at the projections for the future. You see that there's a wider range there because this is what these models uh, do. And this is what these models are proud of. Some models have a bit of a difficulty reproducing the past. Um, and the pattern that you see in the future is actually more homogeneous and smoother than the pattern that we've seen in the past. Right? We've seen episodes in history where energy intensity is flat. We've seen uh, episodes in history where energy intensity uh, increased rather than decreased according to these models in the future. Energy intensity will always decrease. And it's even worse if we go to the carbon intensity, where in uh, the past, yes, that steep declines are possible, shadow declines are possible, uh, but also increases in the carbon intensity are very well possible. This is mainly driven uh, by the rise of India and China, which is coal fuels. Uh, essentially, that explains why it's going up. According to these models in the future, carbon intensity uh, can only go down. So there is a big issue here with what these models do. Unfortunately, they are the only ones we have, um, and therefore we have to rely on them. A crucial part uh, in all of this is what we assume about future reserves of fossil fuels. That is our main source of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the question is, will we run out? And if we run out of coal, then we don't need to worry about the CO2 emissions from coal. Um, so this is a graph that sort of puts all these reserves together. Uh, the unit is converted into units that matter for the atmosphere. Uh, I'll come back uh, to that. The important anchors that you need to uh, think about um, is this unit here. Uh, yeah, just, just focus on 100. This is about how much CO2 we put in the atmosphere over the last 200 years. Uh, about 100 parts per million, and if you want to stay, keep the temperature below 2 degrees uh, warming, then we can emit another 100, right? And this is relative to now. Uh, so this is sort of the political uh, goal that we have of uh, emitting perhaps another 100 parts per million, perhaps a bit less. Then here we have the different uh, fossil fuels. <coughs> so let's start uh, at uh, the top. So at the top we have the gases, natural gas and uh, shale gas, and then uh, the different shades of grey is essentially how certain are we that we have this. So in black we have the reserves, and a reserve is defined as a source of, in this case, fossil fuels that we know exists and we know we can get out of the ground at current prices with current technology. That is a reserve. And then uh, the opposite of a reserve is a resource. And that is stuff that we think we have, that we think may be in the ground, and that one day at future prices, with future technologies, we can get out. Right? And they come in three grades, proves probable and possible. And what you see is that for natural gas, and basically, no, we, have, we think we have discovered everything, basically. Less so uh, with crude oil, uh, there is a uh, good bit uh, that we know about, we know where it is, we know who owns it, we know we can get, a, get it out of the ground, uh, but there is a lot of uncertainty, sort of uh, undiscovered resources uh, or unclaimed resources uh, as well. If we add up the known oil with a known conventional gas, then we end up with around 150 uh, parts per million, which does not bring major climate change. Immediately political ramification here. This is Saudi Arabia. This is Kuwait. This is Qatar. This is Russia. This stuff is elsewhere. It's Brazil. In Angola, right? Uh, there's hardly any undiscovered oil in Saudi Arabia land, right? They basically map their province uh, very, very well. Well, the conventional oil and gas, the mainstays of the current world economy, uh, do not bring a lot of uh, climate change. 
But really what matters for uh, climate change is if we run out of natural gas, which we will within your lifetime, probably within my lifetime, um, what will the place? This is a, a graph of a few years ago. Uh, and shale is here sort of marked as uncertain and unconventional. Uh, this graph will be redrawn, I think, next year. Uh, this comes from the World Energy Council. Um, they'll be redrawn next year, and then the shale will be much bigger and it will be much darker, right? Because by now, uh, the Americans <coughs> have turned this into a proven technology. Same goes for uh, shale oil and it's turning into a proven uh, energy source um, that we can mine at a very low cost. Um, and if we, going back to gas, the conventional gas is not a big deal in climate terms, but if you start adding shale gas, then it becomes a bigger problem. Same is true for the conventional oil, that is not a big deal, but the Tarzans in Canada, they are a big deal, in Venezuela, and the extra heavy oil and, and in Venezuela, they are a big deal. But the biggest deal of all in climate terms is the various forms of coal. We start adding these up the planet and start burning them, uh, the planet can get very, very hot indeed. Right? And the problem with coal is not just the black lines, the things that we know we have and we know we can't get out of the ground. Uh, in fact, coal is so abundant that we've never really looked hard for to find additional coal. So by the time we're running out of this stuff and people will start looking for coal, now seriously, chances are we will find a whole lot more and then what we think we have, right? And there's just not been any serious prospecting uh, for coal, not like on the same scale as we've done for oil and gas. And all of this suggests two things. A, if we want to, and I showed the same thing yesterday with the total fossil fuel reserves, right, that we come through about 10% of the stuff that is in the ground uh, so far. And um, all suggests that we can make uh, the planet a whole lot warmer. Um, it also immediately suggests that what matters for the future of the climate is not conventional oil and gas, because we will be running out of that stuff within your lifetime, uh, but what will replace conventional oil and gas. And if it's coal, uh, we're in deep trouble. If it's something else, um, uh, we may have a uh, much cooler uh, climate. Okay, so what are the options to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions? And I'll come back to this uh, next week. I gave you the chi identity. If something is true in levels, then it's also true in growth rates. So if this equation is true, then what you can do on both sides of the equation is take the log. If x is y, then log x is log y, right, necessarily. Uh, and then if we, and these derivatives are still wrong, and then if we take the first part of the derivative to time uh, of these things, and then we find that if x is y, then the growth rate of x uh, equals the growth rate uh, of y. And that immediately implies uh, that there's basically four things we can do to reduce emissions. The emissions equal population times blah, 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 blah. One way of reducing emissions is to cut the number of people. That's policy that Zimbabwe is following, policy that uh, the Sudan has followed for a long time. It's a policy uh, that Assad is following uh, very uh, heavily uh, at the moment, right? It works. It doesn't make you particularly popular with the people who you represent and who may vote for you, right? So in a democratic country, this is out of the question. But it is very effective, right? I mean, emissions uh, from Syria are falling uh, very, very rapidly. Second thing you can do is reduce economic growth, right? Emissions, the size of the population times people's income. Again, it has proven very effective 
when the Soviet Union collapsed, when Yugoslavia collapsed, and the economic crisis that followed, emissions fell very rapidly. The reason that emissions in Europe aren't growing, I mean, falling a little bit, is because the economy isn't growing, all thanks to the monetary union, right? Uh, it's a great tool for emission reduction. But again, this is not something that you would want to put a political campaign on, that you should shrink the economy because it's good for the climate. That's not something that will get you re-elected, right? Uh, so that means that even in a democratic country, population growth and economic growth are basically untouchable. That means you have two options left. You can save energy or you can switch to different energy sources. And because most politicians and most people uh, would argue that the economy should grow, that means that the growth rates or your, your improvements in energy efficiency and your improvements in carbon efficiency have, be, have to be so high that they overcome economic growth, right? That is what you need to do. And that is a bit of a, 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 a monumental uh, task. Uh, I don't have uh, much time left, so I'll take you through this uh, very quickly, and then we'll come back to this uh, tomorrow. So, if you want to improve energy efficiency, essentially what you want to do is produce the same output, the same level of comfort, but use less energy. There's two ways of doing that. One is technological change, and the second is behavioral change. So, if you... Uh, your fridge breaks down and you replace it with a new fridge or a fridge that is uh, 10 years younger, then it will perform better. It will use less energy for the same amount of cooling. Why is that? Because manufacturers of fridges and of all other uh, appliances think they can, actually pretty sure they can, sell their product better if it's product A and product B, they perform the same way but one has lower running costs, then people will go for the one that has lower running costs, right? And an important component of the running cost of the television or a fridge or anything is, the, is its energy use. So there's simply a competitive advantage in uh, developing a uh, smart thing. This is true for essentially all products, but it's not necessarily captured through improvements in energy efficiency. If you look at cars in the US, then between 1980 and 2005, 2010, cars got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you haven't traveled uh, the US, you may think that occasionally you meet a big fat SUV on the, on the English roads. Not the case at all. I mean, they're pretty small compared to the tanks that you see driving around. Uh, U.S. streets, right? These are big cars. And the first time you see it, you're wow, this is really big. Um, at the same time as the size of cars roughly doubled, their energy performance stayed the same. The mileage, the uh, amount of miles you get per gallon uh, burned, stayed the same. This is really, really impressive, right? And even though these cars hold twice the weight uh, around, they did not burn more energy. So in terms of technical energy efficiency, it was actually a major improvement, but the consumer did not want lower driving costs, but the consumer wanted more space. And a lot of people think that bigger cars are safer, which is actually not true. Um, but uh, a lot of people think that way. So te technological advance, improvements in energy efficiency do not necessarily translate in lower energy use. They may just lead to higher comfort. Similarly, if you uh, insulate your house, uh, you can do two things, right? You can keep the temperature as it was, pretty cold, and burn less oil or whatever you use to heat your home. Uh, but you can also, after it's insulated, for the same price, you can enjoy a higher temperature indoors. And which of the two do you go for?
and please me uh, to behavioral change. A lot of energy uh, is wasted. Engineers reckon that about 30% of the energy that we use has no useful purpose. And this is things such as uh, people uh, filling up their kettle and boiling all the water even though they want to make only one cup of tea, right? They boil five or the, the, the five or six uh, cups of water of tea. You walk around to, uh, the campus, uh, at five o'clock you would see that there's a lot of rooms that are fully lit even though there's nobody in there. It's a complete waste of uh, electricity. Those things are hard to change, right? Uh, because that's sort of ingrained behavior. And I'll come back uh, to that uh, next week. Um, and of course, there's also a whole sort of luxury component uh, to these things. If you decide to take your holiday in Thailand, you will be emitting a lot of uh, CO2 when flying there, right? Unless you go to Turkey or you could just stay in, in, in Brighton, right? And you'd be emitting a lot less. Convincing people that a holiday in Brighton is as exciting as a holiday in Bangkok is, of course, good for the climate, but it's a very hard task uh, to do. Right? So saving energy through behavioral change is not as easy uh, as it sounds.